Hello, everybody, and welcome again to this Law Physics webinar. So after the pause of August, we are going to re reassume with the, with the season five that we are doing now. So before to start, let's remind you that uh, if you are following this in YouTube, all the questions for the speaker in here in the, in the YouTube chat, you can see it, of course, when you in, in, in YouTube. And if you are watching this video in the future, I mean, later, you can leave some comments to the video. So let's talk about the speaker. The speaker is Andrea Vitino. He did the PhD in the University of Torino and, and the University of Paris Diderot. And after that, he is, he is now a postdoc in the Technician University of München. And basically, the, the talk is the title of the talk is A Signature of, of Anisotropic Cosmic Ray. Uh, transport in the gamma ray gamma ray sky. So, Andrea, if you are there, you can start whenever you want. And welcome to this law of physics. Okay, thank you very much, Roberto, for uh, for the introduction and for inviting me. So, let me just share my screen so you can see my slides. Okay, so I hope that everybody can, can see my slides. Yeah, we can see uh, it. Yeah, so uh, as I said, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to take part in this series of webinars. Uh, today, I will talk um, about the signature, as you said, of an isotropic cosmic ray transport in the gamma ray sky. So this uh, talk is based uh, on a paper, on a very recent paper that, I, uh, that I've written in collaboration uh, with Silvio Cerri, Daniele Gaggero, Carmelo Evoli, and Dario Grasso. And obviously, you can find the paper on the archive. Before I start to dig into, let's say, more complicated things, let me just start with a very basic introduction on the topic of uh, cosmic ray transport. And in order to talk about cosmic ray transport, one has to talk about cosmic rays. So here you see the cosmic ray spectrum for different cosmic ray species as measured by several experiments. So one thing that you can see is that um, the energy spectrum of cosmic rays actually covers a wide range of energy, more than 12 orders of magnitude, actually. And these energies are even higher than the energies that can be reached at colliders. So this makes cosmic rays a very good place to look for new physics. You see that antimatter is present in the cosmic ray flux in the form of positrons and antiprotons, but also possibly in the form of uh, light antinuclei. Um, antimatter is obviously a very good place to look for possible um, dark matter signatures. The fact that uh, the cosmic ray energy range extends up to very high energy uh, makes us think that some of the highest energy cosmic ray might be of extragalactic origin. So the, the argument here is very simple. Basically, uh, at some high energy, for example, in the case of protons above uh, 10 to the 8 GV, the Larmor radius of cosmic rays exceeds uh, the size of the galactic disk. And therefore, uh, these cosmic rays might come from, or has to come, from uh, sources that are located outside of the galaxy. You can also see here that uh, what is probably the most striking uh, feature of cosmic rays so cosmic rays have a very simple spectrum. So basically the spectrum is a series of power loads with, um, with the shape, with uh, the slope changing at the knee. Uh, in particular, uh, below the knee, uh, most of the cosmic ray species show uh, what is usually called a universal spectrum. So they all share these uh, e to the minus 2.7 or 2.8 spectrum. This at least to a first approximation, obviously there are uh, deviation from this behavior. The, probably the most famous one is the hardening in the hydrogen and helium spectrum, but the, nevertheless, to a first approximation, a universal spectrum is observed. Uh, the presence of this universal spectrum below the knee suggests uh, the possibility that cosmic rays, galactic cosmic rays, are accelerated by um, a homogeneous class of sources with a rigidity dependent mechanism. Now, this homogeneous class of sources in the, in the standard picture is represented by supernova remnants. So the idea is, is actually uh, quite simple. Um, the standard scenario is that cosmic rays are produced uh, by stars, so are among the end product of 
uh, stellar nucleosynthesis and are then injected in the, in the interstellar medium by a supernova explosion. But before being injected in the interstellar medium, they are uh, accelerated by a diffusive shock acceleration mechanisms that take place in the blast wave of supernova remnants. There are uh, two kinds of um, arguments that can be made in favor of this uh, scenario. One has to do uh, with the energy. So the fact that supernova explosion can power the total luminosity of cosmic ray seems to be plausible. Actually, this idea was introduced in the very old days by Bade and Zwicky in 1934. And even today that we can make more, um, more precise calculation, we know that if uh, we assume a rate of supernova explosion between one and three per century, and if we assume that more or less the 10% of the energy released in the explosion is channeled into the, into the acceleration of cosmic ray, we know that if these numbers are um, the numbers that are realized in, in nature, then we know that supernova explosions can uh, power the total luminosity of cosmic rays. Another uh, very important argument in favor of the so-called supernova remnant paradigm is that if cosmic rays are accelerated um, by diffusive shock acceleration mechanism within supernova remnant, then they acquire um, universal spectrum. And this is because uh, diffusive shock acceleration mechanisms are a specific kind of first order Fermi acceleration mechanism. And within this mechanism, the particles that are accelerated acquire uh, a spectrum that is uh, a power law with an index that depends only on the properties of the shock. So this makes this kind of mechanism very appealing, obviously. So um, as you have seen, this scenario is quite successful. So it seems that the supernova paradigm is actually um, a good paradigm. It seems very plausible, but nevertheless, one has to take into account that not all cosmic rays are produced in stars and then accelerated in supernova remnants because we have the so-called uh, secondary cosmic rays. So to understand the distinction between primary and secondary cosmic rays, one, have, one has to look uh, at the relative abundances uh, of elements in cosmic rays and in the galaxy. And here we take the solar system as uh, a proxy for the, for the abundances of elements in the galaxy. So you can see that there are elements that are as abundant in cosmic rays as they are in the solar system. And these elements are, for example, the hydrogen, the helium, or the carbon, etc. So these cosmic rays are the ones that are called primary cosmic rays. These are the cosmic rays that fit into the supernova remnant paradigm that I was describing in the previous slide. So these are those cosmic rays that are uh, synthesized in stars and then accelerated by supernova remnants. But on the other hand, there are also secondary cosmic rays. So secondary cosmic rays are the ones for which uh, the abundance is, uh, as you can see, um, is much higher in the cosmic ray than in the, in the solar system. Uh, these elements are, for example, the lithium, the beryllium, uh, and the boron. And the idea is that these cosmic ray species are produced uh, installation reactions that involve heavier cosmic ray species that collide against uh, particles of the interstellar medium. And it is important to point out that these cosmic rays are usually not uh, assumed to be accelerated by supernova remnants um, unless they are produced directly inside the shock region. Okay, so this was, uh, let's say, a very basic overview on uh, the topic of cosmic ray and on the topic of cosmic ray origin. Uh, the main topic of this talk will be uh, cosmic ray propagation. So the idea is, is very simple, actually. So cosmic ray, uh, after they have uh, been produced in a, in a source, so for example, supernova remnant, as you see here, have to travel uh, across the galaxy before being detected at Earth or anywhere else uh, in the galaxy. The cosmic ray propagation is actually a quite complicated process. Under a mathematical point of view, this process is modeled uh, by means of a transport equation as the one that you can uh, see here. So this transport equation contains a lot of terms. In particular, well, first of all, one has to say that this equation uh, is in terms of n, where uh, the variable n represents the cosmic ray momentum density. Then uh, it is important to point out that um, the transport equation is time dependent. Uh, usually, as it could be for this talk, uh, one assumes um, a steady-state scenario. So one study cosmic ray in a situation in which 
and is constant in time, but this is not uh, necessary. Uh, going to the right hand side of the equation, we, uh, the first term that we need is the source term, that is basically the number of particles injected per unit of time, volume, and energy. And this term can model both the primary and the secondary emission. Then we have the spatial diffusion, that is the result of the interaction of cosmic rays with the turbulent component of the galactic magnetic field. I will talk uh, much more about uh, the spatial diffusion later on in the talk. Basically, this will be uh, the main topic of this talk. Then we have uh, advection. So we have the possibility that cosmic rays uh, are advected away from the galactic disk by uh, a wind. And it is um, uh, worth to stress, out, uh, to stress that if um, this wind increases with a vertical uh, with a vertical height above the galactic disk then advection also causes uh, energy losses as you see here so we have adiabatic energy loss we have reacceleration so reacceleration is basically a diffusion in momentum space once again due to the interaction uh, of cosmic rays with the turbulent uh, component of the galactic magnetic field we can think of reacceleration as uh, being the, the counterpart in momentum space of spatial diffusion. Uh, finally, we have energy losses. Energy losses are different if we are talking about cosmic ray leptons, because in this case, we may have synchrotron emission, inverse Compton or Bremsstrahlung, which are the dominant processes. In the case of nucleons, we have uh, Coulomb losses and ionization. Okay, so this was uh, a very basic introduction to the topic of cosmic ray uh, propagation. Now, let me just uh, briefly explain how one study uh, cosmic ray propagation. So actually, in order to put all the ingredients inside uh, the equation that I showed you in the previous slides, one has to compare theoretical predictions, which are uh, obviously based on, on the formulas that I have uh, described. So one has to compare this prediction with experimental observation. And uh, experimental observation are basically of two different kinds. So we have local observables, which are also direct observables in the sense that uh, what is measured is uh, the cosmic ray particle itself that is measured by detectors that are on um, satellite uh, experiments or balloon borne experiments or even uh, on spacecraft. So, to make some example of local observable, here you see, for example, the primary fluxes, the secondary to primary ratios, the interstellar fluxes. Here by interstellar fluxes, I mean cosmic ray fluxes measured uh, outside of the area of influence of the solar magnetic field. So this measurement actually was uh, made possible by uh, the Voyager 1 uh, spacecraft that reached uh, the boundary of the, um, uh, of the heliopause um, in, in recent years. So actually, this is actually a measurement that is uh, not so local in the sense that it's pretty far away from, from Earth. Then we have the measurement of antimatter fluxes, which as I said at the beginning of the talk, uh, are very important if one is looking for dark matter. Together with these local observables, we also have non-local observables, which are indirect in the sense that what uh, one measures is not uh, the cosmic ray particle itself, but it's the radiation emitted by uh, the cosmic ray particle in the neutrino, radio, or gamma ray uh, sky. And these observables are obviously no local in the sense that one can measure this emission uh, basically everywhere, uh, everywhere in the sky. Uh, in this talk, I will focus on, uh, on the gamma ray measurement. So here you see uh, a map of um, of the gamma ray sky as seen by the Fermilat uh, experiment. So basically, if we are uh, looking for gamma rays produced by uh, cosmic rays, we may have three different processes. So we may have, in the case of cosmic ray protons, um, they can impact against um, hydrogen atoms in the interstellar uh, medium. These uh, lead to the creation of a neutral pion that then decay into uh, a couple of photons. In the case of cosmic ray leptons, we can have either uh, inverse Compton scattering, as you see here on the interstellar radiation field, or we can have uh, Bram Stralung. In, in this talk, I will be uh, mainly focusing, as you will see, um, on the gamma ray emission across the galactic plane. 
And the dominant process that uh, leads to the production of gamma ray in this region of the sky is actually the pi LDK. This is because of the abundance of protons in cosmic rays together with the abundance of hydrogen in interstellar gas. What uh, is very important and actually is one of the key uh, things to understand to, to get into the message of this talk is that by mapping the emission, this is a gamma ray emission across the galactic plane, one is able to map the cosmic ray proton distribution across the galactic plane. So this is obviously a, a fundamental feature and is actually the starting point for, for my talk. So in this talk, I will uh, discuss what the map of the, of the proton distribution across the galactic plane might be uh, telling us about cosmic ray transport. So my starting point will be, as I said, the proton distribution inferred from gamma ray observation. And I will try to see what this can be telling us about cosmic ray transport. I will focus on a particular uh, aspect of cosmic ray transport, that is the spatial diffusion, which is the dominant process is if we are studying the, um, the transport of galactic protons with energies that are not too low. In particular, in this talk, I will try to show that uh, these gamma ray observations um, might be calling for a more complex modeling of spatial diffusion with respect to the standard picture. So I will try to justify a sort of a change of paradigm in, in the description of, uh, of the spatial diffusion. So before doing all that, let me just describe what is the standard picture of cosmic ray spatial diffusion. The standard picture is actually uh, very simple. And to, to understand it, we have to go back once again to the transport equation, which you see here. So if you remember uh, some slides ago, I, I told you that spatial diffusion is modeled by, um, by this term here, and in particular is modeled by means of a diffusion coefficient that is uh, spatially independent. And it's usually assumed to be uh, a power law in rigidity. So it goes like the momentum to this power of delta. And delta is assumed to have no uh, spatial dependence whatsoever. So over the years, this kind of approach has been very successful. So this um, standard picture of cosmic ray uh, diffusion has proven to be very successful in, for example, in reproducing all the local observables, such as, for example, primary fluxes or secondary to primary ratios. And so given the fact that this is the, the standard picture and given the, the success of this kind of interpretation uh, of spatial diffusion in describing uh, experimental observation, one may ask what is the shape of the proton spectrum that is predicted by uh, such a framework? Uh, the answer is once again, uh, very simple, in the sense that if we uh, consider um, a purely diffusive transport, so if we remove from the transport equation all the terms that, um, that are different from the from spatial diffusion, so we are left with the source term and the diffusion term. And if we assume that the, uh, the source term goes like momentum uh, raised to the power of minus alpha injection, so this is basically uh, the index um, of the, the spectrum that is injected by supernova Ramna. So if the shape of the source term is this one, then we have that the uh, the solution to the transport equation, to the purely diffusive transport equation, is a power law in momentum with an index that is delta plus alpha injection. So uh, to sum up, in the standard picture of cosmic ray uh, spatial diffusion, the uh, proton spectrum is assumed to be uh, the same everywhere in the galaxy. So it's a power law with an index that does not depend on, uh, on the on the spatial coordinates. One can check if this, uh, if this prediction is actually what is seen in, in, in nature. And this was, for example, done by the Fermilab collaboration that measured the proton spectral index across the galactic plane at different distances from the galactic center. The result of this uh, measurement is shown here in this plot. So you see here that the proton spectral index is plotted as a function of the galactocentric radius. The prediction from a spatially independent diffusion, uh, as I shown you in the, in the previous slide, is an horizontal line because the, the spectrum is expected to be the same everywhere across the galactic plane. 
But what is seen is rather different. So what is seen is uh, an hardening. So there is an int for this hardening. And my point is that this hardening might represent a possible challenge to this standard picture of cosmic ray spatial diffusion. Obviously, one here has to, um, let's say, to consider things with uh, a sort of caution in the sense that, as you can see, error bars are quite large. So we can think of an int. There's not really an evidence for an hardening. And also, as you can see, there is this point at one kiloparsec that is uh, that doesn't really fit into this picture. So all these things have to be kept in mind for the reminder of the talk, let's say. One thing that is uh, worth to point out is that this hardening seems to be uh, fairly well compatible with the one that was uh, invoked in a series of paper by Gajer et al. from 2014 on. So basically in this paper, what was proposed is a sort of phenomenological model in which the diffusion coefficient as this shape here. So you see that the, the rigidity scaling of the diffusion coefficient has a spatial dependence with respect to the gravitocentric radius. And this spatial dependence was tuned uh, with respect to some, uh, let's say, some old Fermilat data. So they are not related to this very recent analysis, but still um, the, the hardening that is predicted within this model is compatible with the hardening that is now observed by uh, this very recent analysis. Okay, so the, the message that I want to convey in this talk is that this hardening, so the, um, this hardening that seems to be observed by this very recent Fermilat analysis, might be uh, qualitatively similar to a hardening that can be obtained by assuming uh, spatial diffusion to be anisotropic. So this is the, let's say the main message of the talk. And uh, the first thing that obviously we have to, to address now is what is actually anisotropic diffusion. And yeah, let's just start from the basics. So if one consider uh, the Gatti magnetic field to be the sum of a regular and a turbulent component, as it's usually done. So you see here we have a regular component that is this V0 and delta V that is the turbulent component. Obviously, as I said at the beginning of the talk, uh, it is the interaction with this uh, turbulent component that uh, generates the cosmic ray spatial diffusion. So if this is the situation, then we have obviously that diffusion can be either parallel to the regular component of the magnetic field or perpendicular to this, uh, to this vector. And we talk about anisotropic diffusion if these two diffusion coefficients, uh, the parallel and the perpendicular one, are different. So obviously, in the, in the standard picture of, of spatial diffusion, this does not happen. So the two are equal, and they are equal to, uh, to the diffusion coefficient that is basically a number. In anisotropic diffusion, these two are different. OK, so this uh, was just a very basic definition. Uh, let me just dig a bit deeper into anisotropic diffusion, and let me present you some theoretical motivation for uh, for anisotropic diffusion. So in order to uh, introduce some theoretical motivation, I would like to start from the quasi-linear theory of pitch angle scattering in a random magnetic field. This is like the, the basic framework when dealing with uh, cosmic ray diffusion. And a key prediction of this uh, theoretical framework is that the ratio between the perpendicular and the parallel transport uh, goes like uh, the ratio between the turbulent fluctuation of the magnetic field and the regular component of the magnetic field squared. So this quantity, this delta V over V0, is expected to be one at the scale at which the turbulence is injected. So for example, if the turbulence is assumed to be injected by supernova explosion, then delta V over V0 is equal to one at 100 parsec. For all the scales that are smaller than this uh, 100 parsec, so for example, for all the scales that are relevant for the propagation of protons with energy between the GV and the TV, this delta B over B0 is expected to be uh, much less than one. So in this uh, domain, which is also the domain of applicability of quasi-linear theory, this, um, so since delta B over B0 is, very, uh, is much smaller than one, then the ratio between the perpendicular and the parallel transport is also much uh, smaller than one, which means 
uh, that the quasi-linear theory predicts a highly anisotropic diffusion. Now, um, quasi-linear theory is not the, the final word in, when it comes to spatial diffusion in the sense that there are uh, effects that are not included in the quasi-linear theory treatment that can complicate the picture. This kind of effect are usually uh, studied in the framework of numerical simulations. And as you can see from the results of these numerical simulations that I show you in the slides, so these results are taken from two, uh, from two different papers. So you see that even if this uh, effect might uh, complicate the, let's say the theoretical framework, uh, nevertheless, the bottom line is not altered. So the need for anisotropic diffusion is still there. You can see that the parallel and the perpendicular transport, the parallel and the perpendicular diffusion coefficient have uh, a different normalization and a different rigidity scaling. Okay, so this was um, a sort of basic introduction and a motivation for anisotropic diffusion. So given this motivation, we implemented um, a model of anisotropic diffusion. And we did that in the framework of the Dragon 2 code which is the, the, the new version of Dragon. Uh, if you are interested in the, in the details of the code, I address you to this uh, reference where the code was actually presented and all the details were given. Let me just stress that anisotropic diffusion will actually be one of the key features of Dragon 2. So uh, to describe a bit in more detail our setup, we consider, uh, as I said, a transport equation where only uh, the diffusive term is present together with the source term. We uh, restrict ourselves to the two-dimensional case. This was done uh, basically for a technical reason in the sense that uh, working in two dimensions is obviously uh, much easier than working in three dimensions. We uh, took the source term uh, from the, let's say, the standard uh, model of Lori Meretal. So basically here Q represents um, the source term, uh, the proton source term uh, from supernova remnant. And we uh, used a diffusion tensor, that is this Dij, that can account for possible anisotropy. And what does this mean? Well, it means that we define the, source, uh, the diffusion tensor in this way. So you see that it is basically given by the, the sum of the perpendicular and parallel uh, diffusion coefficient each one of these two diffusion coefficients is weighted uh, upon the, let's say, the geometry of the regular component of the galactic magnetic field. For the two um, diffusion coefficients, the, the parallel and the perpendicular, we assume a very simple form. So they, have, they are uh, two power laws. But since we want to include a possible anisotropy in our framework, we um, use for these two power laws a different rigidity scaling. So uh, in particular for uh, the, rigidity, the rigidity scaling of the parallel diffusion coefficient, we assume delta equal to 0 0.3, while in the case of perpendicular diffusion, we consider values from 0 0.5 to 0 0.7. These are not just random numbers, but they are uh, based on a low energy extrapolation of the result of uh, numerical simulation. And also in the case of uh, the normalization, we uh, consider two different normalization for these uh, diffusion coefficients. But actually we are uh, kind of agnostic in the sense that this epsilon b, that is the, the ratio between um, the perpendicular and, and the parallel, uh, we consider it to be between 0 0.01, which is uh, relatively strong anisotropy, and one, where one is uh, almost uh, isotropic case. Okay, so as one can see, the key point now uh, that will determine the shape of the diffusion tensor is uh, actually the magnetic field. So the regular component of the magnetic field. We model such magnetic field as being given by uh, the sum of three uh, components. So we, we have an halo field, a disk field, and a poloidal field. For the halo plus disk field, we, um, we assume the model by uh, Chirkov et al. So basically our field is purely azimuthal. Well, in the case of the poloidal field, we take the model from Johnson and Farrar. So um, the, this poloidal field has the, this X shape. So basically, it's perfectly vertical at the galactic center, and then it has an inclination in the RC plane that grows as we move outside of the, of the galactic center. 
Here you see the, the total uh, magnetic field, which is the sum of these three components. So you see some of the, of the field lines. So basically, just to sum up the basic feature, this field is uh, predominantly directed in the vertical direction when we are close to the galactic center, and it becomes increasingly azimuthal as we move outside um, of the galactic center. Okay, so this was uh, the setup. So I think I've given a complete description of the different ingredients of our, uh, of our setup. Let me show you now some results. So first of all, I will uh, talk about the profile of the spectral index, the proton spectral index. So here you see that I plot the, the proton spectral index for protons with energy between 10 GB and 100 GB as a function of the galactocentric radius. Um, so these blue lines correspond to the result of our model. This is uh, for a ratio between the normalization of 0 0.01 uh, delta parallel is fixed to 0 0.3, and the two different lines correspond to delta perpendicular equal to 0 0.5 in the case of the blue dashed line, and 0 0.7 in the case of the blue solid line. Here you see also in this um, green uh, dashed line the results of the phenomenological model by Gadget et al. So you can see that we actually get an hardening, so the, um, the spectral index uh, becomes smaller if we are at the galactic center. The entity of this hardening is between 0 0.27 and 0 0.58. So these numbers are just uh, the difference between the spectral in the, the local spectral index and the spectral index at the galactic center. The reason why uh, we have this hardening is uh, actually is pretty simple. So the idea is that at the galactic center, the dominant process is the parallel cosmic ray diffusion along the vertical direction. So in this region, uh, the spectral index goes like alpha injection plus delta parallel. On the other end, when we move outside from the galactic center, the dominant process is um, the diffusion in the azimuthal direction. And therefore, if we are working in two dimension, this, is, um, this means that we have a perpendicular diffusion both along R and along Z. And this means that the spectral index goes like alpha injection plus delta, per, uh, delta perpendicular. So given this, and uh, given also the fact that delta parallel is smaller than uh, delta perpendicular, one can immediately understand why there is an hardening. Uh, the situation is uh, qualitatively uh, the same, let's say, for um, the case in which the ratio between the normalization of the diffusion coefficients is set to 0 0.1. The, the entity of the hardening is different. Actually, we have a, a, let's say a smaller hardening. But um, let's say the agreement with data is still uh, qualitatively good. Things become uh, a bit more tricky if we look at the normalization, actually, of, of the flux. So this is the integral of the uh, proton flux, so the, the proton density, basically. So you see that these colored lines correspond to the result of our anisotropic uh, model. Um, the, the color code is the same as in the previous plots. So the red lines are for uh, ratio between the normalization that is 0 0.1, while in the case of blue lines, this is for uh, epsilon d equal to 0 0.01. Again, different lines are for different values of delta perpendicular, while delta parallel is, is um, still equal to 0 0.3. We also show the results obtained with the isotropic model. Um, and these are obtained by setting delta to 0 0.3. So since this is an isotropic model, we have delta equal everywhere. So it's everywhere equal to 0 0.3, both for parallel and perpendicular diffusion, of course. So you can see that actually it's very difficult to reproduce the, um, uh, the data that are observed by, by Fermilab. So you see that uh, close to the galactic center, since our dominant process is the cosmic ray escape along the vertical direction, we have a very efficient uh, depletion of cosmic ray from, uh, from galaxy. This means that the, the cosmic ray density actually decreases uh, quite a lot, even too much in the case of the strong uh, anisotropy, so in the case in which epsilon is 0 0.01. But this behavior seems to be uh, at least qualitatively in agreement with the, with the first data point uh, of the Fermilat analysis. So you see that even uh, data seems to point towards this uh, depletion. And this is not observed in the isotropic model. On the other hand, 
in, within our anisotropic setup, it's basically impossible to reproduce this peak at uh, three kiloparsec. So it's always uh, too smeared. So it's uh, important to, to stress that this peak is already present in the source function. So cosmic rays are injected with this peak, and in our setup, this peak is too uh, smeared. Um, this is still actually an open issue, which we are investigating. We are uh, considering two different possibilities at the moment. So for example, um, this disagreement with data might be alleviated if one consider a different source term. This is actually uh, kind of obvious. And also, uh, this makes sense if we consider that the source term is not that well known. Uh, on the other hand, one may have also a better agreement with data uh, by uh, working in a full three-dimensional uh, framework because uh, at this distance from the galactic center, so uh, around three kiloparsec, uh, there is one of the spiral arms of the galaxy, so one may assume that uh, cosmic ray diffusion might be very efficient along, the, uh, along this uh, azimuthal direction, and this might reduce the impact of the vertical escape. But these are, as I said, all uh, hypotheses which we are uh, still investigating. So it's time uh, to get to my conclusions since I'm already over time. Uh, so in this talk, I discussed um, anisotropic diffusion and I've shown you some possible signatures of anisotropic diffusion in the gamma ray diffusion mission. Uh, in particular, I've shown you that some of these features might be um, similar to some features that are hinted by uh, this very recent uh, Fermilab analysis. Uh, nevertheless, I've shown you that uh, the picture is still uh, not totally clear. Things are uh, not so easy to, to model. And therefore, it's very important to, um, let's say, to uh, investigate also a more complex uh, full three-dimensional setup, because in this case, we'll be, uh, we will be able to explore an even wider uh, phenomenology, and this will and this will make us able to uh, perform a much more precise comparison between theory and the uh, data. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. It was a very interesting talk, indeed. Uh, so before going to the, to the uh, question round, let's just remind to the people that is following this webinar that you can do all the questions to Andrea via the YouTube chat. And um, yeah, now that we are open to questions. So please, everybody in the, in the room that can unmute themselves and ask questions to Andrea, please. Okay, I have a question. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, Andrea, so at the very beginning, you talk about this acceleration of cosmic rates and you talk about this uh, supernova remnant hypothesis yeah uh, actually is there a way of for testing that I, I don't think so but I just wondering if it's possible to do it uh, you mean to test the, the supernova hypothesis yes I mean yeah I mean because media really accelerated there but I think that uh, well uh, a basic test is uh, what I've already briefly mentioned that is the Let's say the energy balance of, uh, of the galaxy. So if you consider what is the, the total luminosity of cosmic ray, uh, you will actually realize that there are not many uh, sources that can provide such a high uh, luminosity. So I think that this is already quite a, a test for this, uh, for this hypothesis. Now, I am really not expert in this, uh, in this field, but I. I, I mean, I think that there are no other galactic source that can provide that much uh, energy. For example, you can consider the case of pulsars, but I think that the maximal energy that, can, that they can provide is at least one order of magnitude too smaller to, to power uh, the total amount of galactic uh, cosmic ray. Okay, so it's basically the only option. I think yes, but uh, as I said, I'm not really expert in, in cosmic ray origin or in cosmic ray production, so might be, uh, maybe there are some other options that I don't know. Okay, thanks. 
So more questions. I, I have a couple of questions, but uh, maybe Nicolas, you want to make one? Uh, I have another one, but you can go if you want. Yeah, yeah no, I, I was just wondering, uh, Andrea, for the case of the hardening, I mean, you, you, you invoke the, the anisotropic diffusion. But yeah. is it also possible to, to achieve the same effect, with, for example, with convection, changing the, the standard picture of vertical galactic wind to something that can also be especially dependent? Yeah, actually, it's possible. But there is, a, there is a difference between this scenario and the one in which the hardening is related to, to advection. And the difference is that um, if you uh, explain the hardening in terms of advection, you have an effect that is present only at low energies. Because the, um, so if you compare the effect of advection with the one of diffusion, then at some energy you have that diffusion will start to dominate. So if you, um, if you want to, to explain the hardening in terms of advection, you will have a, an hardening that is efficient at low energy, but it's not efficient at high energy. And it seems that, uh, I mean, both from the, um, from the Fermi lat analysis, but also from the, for example, the measurement of the uh, multi-TV uh, gamma ray emission that was performed by Milagro some years ago. So it was, what they measured was the, the gamma ray emission at around 20 TV uh, at some point in the galactic plane. I don't really remember the region of the sky, but so if you consider this, uh, this measurement, there are some hints that the hardening is present also in the multi-TV region of the proton spectrum. And it's very, I, I think it's very difficult to, uh, to have an hardening that extends up to this high energy by means of advection. So this would be my answer. Ah, okay, so it's not possible in this. Yeah, because of the... No, I was wondering because since the, the hardening is just with the data of Fermi at lower than 10 GeV proton energy. So uh, no, Actually, it's higher than, than 10 GeV. I mean, it's... Uh, I, I, so I read uh, opposite the... Yeah. The less than or greater than. So, and the other, the other question that I was also wondering, because, okay, this is the analysis based on proton plus uh, kind of... Prenstralum and Compton loses the, 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 the emission of gamma rays and pion production and so on and so forth. So, is it possible that also with electrons and inverse Compton you can have an, uh, an extra information about your anisotropic diffusion, but to high Z, for instance, or high vertical? Because since electrons, they, they are going to emit inverse Compton by the interaction with the CMB, for instance, you are going to be able to map what is the dependence of this anisotropic diffusion to higher latitude? It's uh, just a question. I don't know if, if Dragon is already included the, this type of effect for electrons, but I think it could be a well, uh, possibility to test furthermore this hypothesis. Yeah, I think it's, it would be interesting, actually. So, yeah, I agree that uh, electrons can give uh, much, uh, I mean, can give a complementary information for uh, regions away from the galactic disk. Under a technical point of view, this is rather difficult to, to model because if you are dealing with uh, leptons, actually, you must work in a three-dimensional framework. So to include, for example, the, the emission, uh, I mean, the, the spiral pattern in, in the source term, for example. Mm -hmm. And just by a technical point of view, at the moment, is uh, is actually very, it's very difficult to work in this, uh, this three-dimensional framework. But at some point, we, we will try to, to do it. I mean, we are trying to do it. Yeah, yeah, well, for instance, this type of isotropic diffusion is not included in Galprop, at least. Uh, I think, I mean, in the current version of Galprop, the, the one that, for me, is a fair be useless for, for analyzing the data, no? Well, as far as I know, I mean, this, uh, this formalism, I mean, this fully mm -hmm. anisotropic diffusion at the moment should be uh, only present in, in Dragon. So it's not okay. present in Galpro. So in some sense, you are one step ahead of <laughs> Galpro. Yeah, but the three dimensions are not simple because you have a, I mean, just to give you some technical detail, uh, when you are modeling anisotropic diffusion, you have all the mixed derivative uh, terms in the, 
the diffusion equation. And the discretization of these terms is uh, actually very, is very difficult. So you cannot use this, uh, the crank nicholson method. You have to use a fully explicit uh, scheme. And because of this, you have to use a time step that is very, that is very small in the, mm -hmm. in the evolution of the numerical uh, solution. And therefore, it's, very, it's actually very slow to, to get to the, to the solution. No, yeah, yeah. Very one, one, one more dimension is, is crazy because it's already, let's say, two dimensions by your code. I mean, the spherical symmet the cylindrical symmetrical is two dimensions for the spatial plus energy. Uh, yeah. already, let's say a three. And in also, if you want that this stuff is stabilized in time, you have to add a time also. So actually, to give you an idea, these results are based on some runs that lasted for uh, some days so if you add the dimension you add at least a factor of i don't know 40 or 50 to this time so at the moment is not unfeasible but it's rather uh, i mean it's not simple mm -hmm. so i don't know uh, i guess there are other questions from people from the from the hangout i have a second one please no, it, it's about the galactic magnetic field. So Andrea, you show this like model with three components. So I was wondering if you if you're taking into account some uncertainties on that. Uh, I don't know if I understood completely the question. So you, you say if we consider uncertainty on the magnetic field model. Right. Uh, actually, uh, no, in the sense that for these uh, results, we only consider uh, one um, one magnetic field moment, uh, one magnetic field model, and this was uh, done basically before uh, because of the uh, let's say of the technical difficulties that I have described uh, earlier. So since the runs were actually kind of long, it's very difficult to to actually take into account all the uncertainty. But uh, if you look at our paper, we also consider uh, a toy model for the magnetic field. So before um, uh, presenting these uh, results obtained with a realistic model, we also investigated a, a toy model in which we, um, I mean, we introduced in this toy model some parameters and we studied the effect of the variation of these parameters. So, yeah, the answer is that we did not really take into account all the uncertainties, but uh, in the paper we investigated what might be the impact of some ingredients of the magnetic. Uh, Field uh, modeling in the result. Okay, thanks. So, other questions? Because uh, now that you were saying this stuff with the hardening of the of the spectral index, it'll, then when you play with the with the ratio between d zero and d parallel, I mean the yeah the ratio between all the magnetic fields, the turbulent or the regular or the other. And then you can also invert the type of the hardening, you know? It's complete. In the yeah. solution, you can have both the scenario in the sense that it's harder in the galactic center and less harder outside, and then also inverted because of this ratio. If you, instead to use 0 0.1, you use 10, for instance, just to, to play with the... Yeah, I mean, and, uh, under a mathematical point of view, yes, for sure. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, and just physically realistic because I, I mean, it's kind of obvious that the diffusion along the magnetic field is uh, easier to realize than the diffusion in a perpendicular direction. Mm -hmm. So one expects uh, the parallel to be bigger than the perpendicular. Yeah. Oh, no, no, yeah, that was just when, because you were mentioning that in, uh, you, you were working in a paper in which you were exploring more the variation with the parameters. So yeah. since this ratio was an essential parameter in, the, in all the description, so just to know the, the other kinds type of example that can be covered. Yeah. So I don't know, everybody, anybody has question? I'm gonna go just to remember the people that if we're still in the question round, so if you have a question for Andrea, please write it in the comment. Also, all the questions that possible. For instance, now I was remember the, in the case of, if you go to very high energy, this scheme also, it break it down or I mean, or is it in the sense, can it 
possible to try to explain the this transition between the so-called galactic extragalactic break in the spectral index or, or? Uh, well I, I don't think you can really explain that actually at some point it will break down in the sense that uh, since the rigidity scaling of the perpendicular diffusion is uh, with a higher index at some point at some energy they will become equal i mean the mm -hmm. diffusion will become isotropic and yeah so therefore there will not be the hardening anymore but this is i think to at very high energy yeah more than the energies that are yeah for I sure mean, more than the tv scale that we are considering here yeah so that, that could be a kind of prediction of the of this description to expect that this hardening disappears after certain energy. Yes, I mean, if you have data up to very. No, of course. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. So, okay, let's. If there are no more questions here, in the. Well, okay, in the, the question that they were in the YouTube chat, I already did. Let me, let me ask one question here. Ah, okay, go ahead. Um, so I was wondering if uh, if neutrino data could be useful here, like uh, the neutrinos coming uh, measured in ice cube. Uh, actually, I think yes. In the sense, I mean, if there is a, I mean, if there is an hardening uh, in the proton spectrum, um, so you expect on, on one side to have more uh, gamma rays at high energy, but also more uh, neutrinos. So the, the galactic component of the neutrino emission will be um, will be larger. Um, so in principle, yes, a neutrino can uh, provide a further confirmation of this scenario, uh, provided that one has uh, sufficient statistics. And this right. is the, the weak point. Yeah, but but you wouldn't expect. Uh, the neutrino flux to be um, affected by the by the by the magnetic uh, field, right? Uh, so they could provide some sort of normalization of the flux, maybe. Uh, you don't expect the, the magnetic field to to impact the the neutrino, but yes, you have. I mean, within our model, you have that the proton flux is. Um, is harder towards the galactic center, so you have um, a much um, larger uh, number of high energy protons, and therefore you have a higher uh, neutrino emission from these protons. So, uh, what you expect is that from the inner galaxy, you should see more neutrinos. Okay, okay, thank you. But this is of course only the, the galactic component, so one has to to see if this is visible in the total uh, neutrino flux. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, more questions. Uh, uh, now that since it seems a kind of a regular question in all the webinars, the what about the, the role of the a possible source related with dark matter in this scenario? Could, do you expect also to, to be able to explain, for instance, the, the galactic center emission without breaking down other type of observables related with cosmic rays? Quentin, how is affected B over C also? I mean, to make everything compatible in this scenario. Uh, well, it's... I, I guess there are two questions, but <laughs> let's, let's just, just focus on the dark matter, I guess. Not in the B over C that I just mentioned. <laughs> well, it, I mean, so you have to assume that these, uh, these gamma rays that, um, that Fermi is seeing are produced by a dark matter component. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe this could be plausible. I don't know. It depends a lot on the dark matter model that you are considering. I. Well, I would say probably it's not excluded. I don't know how plausible it is, but mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I was, yeah, I mean, also there is a direct emission from gamma rays, but I was thinking in the case for instance, antiprotons and stuff like this. What in the, uh, so you are saying that, well, I, that's kind of, uh, I think it's difficult to, to have a, a dark matter particle that, so it will, I mean, because if you wanted to, to explain, for example, this hardening that I was talking about, well, I mean, you can always, I think you can think about a model in which you produce no antiprotons, but you produce gamma rays. So this will work at least with respect to the, uh, to the antiproton constraint. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can evade all the other gamma ray constraints. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was thinking this because since there is very strong constraint on the, antiproton over proton ratio, especially for the case of dark matter. So I don't know if the anisotropic diffusion could also affect this type of ratios. Uh, Even well, though that is, this is a local measurement, it's not a measurement at the galactic center, or it, you cannot infer this ratio at, at different levels of, yeah. of distance with the, with the galactic center. But One thing that one, can, one has to point out that is actually kind of interesting is that Within our scenario, the antiproton constraints uh, to dark matter will be a bit weaker because if you assume that cosmic ray tend to escape from the galactic center along the vertical direction, then since dark matter is mostly uh, concentrated in the galactic center, then you will uh, weaken the constraints because the antiproton produced by dark matter will just um, escape along the vertical direction. Mm -hmm. They will not reach us, and so in the local observable, you will see a weaker antiproton flux from dark matter. Now, this probably will not be a huge effect in the sense that if you consider, for example, an NFW profile for, for dark matter, and I think that the, the emission that comes from the inner kiloparsecs of the galaxy should be no more than a 40% or something like that. So, you, you can lower the, the bounds on dark matter annihilation cross-section by this quantity uh, at most. If you assume that all the antiprotons within the inner parsecs uh, simply go away, I mean, they go away in the vertical direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Ah, okay, yeah, interesting. So, okay, let's check if there are questions. No, there are no questions in the YouTube chat. I don't know if somebody else has questions for Andrea. So if not, I guess it's time to to finish this webinar, I, first of all, I want to thank Andrea. It was a very interesting talk. I mean, I like it a lot, especially because of the topic. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and of course, for the people that is watching the webinar, thank you for following us. And for the people that will is watching the video in, in our YouTube channel, don't forget to, if you are interested in all the topics that we are covering in these webinars, to give a like to the video, leave a comment and also consider to subscribe to the YouTube video, to the, our YouTube channel. Uh, we will meet again in, in a couple of weeks with a new webinar in this series of the Law Physics. So thank you everybody for following and see you in the next time.